with uh, our uh, last panel, our last session, I will be uh, chairing the session, I will be introducing the discussant and then uh, briefly, uh, I will move on to, to the papers. So it is my pleasure to be chairing our last session co uh, called Convergences. Uh, and uh, the, um, it includes three papers uh, from Michael Nylan, Shou Fuyin, and Trenton Wilson. And the discussant is uh, Professor Xiaoyong Yang, who is uh, Associate Professor and Chair of East Asian Studies, uh, Studies at Denison University. He's an intellectual historian of medieval China with interest in ideas relating to empire and ethnicity. And his uh, first book is The Way of the Barbarians, Redrawing Ethnic Boundaries in Tang and Sung China. And uh, we will uh, start with the papers as usual, have comments from the discussant right after the paper, and then have a response from the speakers and the general discussion at the very end. Uh, so without further delay, Michael, I leave the floor to you if you want to share your PowerPoint or share. Yes. Share. Um, what I want to say um, and have this be recorded. Mm -hmm. um, oh, shoot. I'm going to, I on purpose made certain it was on my desktop, but it's not. I have it if you want. I, can um, I think I'm just going to go if I'm okay with you, just take a minute and I'll just blather. Um, <laughs> that, um, um, I'm trying to get out of here, don't say, um, and trying somehow to activate this. Okay. Um, now I'm back onto Zoom and I should be able to share the screen um, with luck. Um, I'm on Zoom. Why am I not being able? I keep flipping in. Um, actually, Lisa, if I can't do this in a minute, I'm having trouble getting back. There I am. Um, so there we are. Um, finally, I'm sharing. Okay, yes. this is part of a larger show. Uh, a part of a larger project and the larger project um, is definitely um, on the politics of the common good in early China. I have a colleague who wrote on the politics of the common good, Hans Schluge, a very great book. Um, but of course, when you don't add in some place, you know it's Western philosophy. So I thought early China also deserved um, um, uh, to have a politics of the common good uh, because I've been working on the documents classic and all I'm seeing uh, by working through these early materials along with excavated materials um, is the common good. So my paper is entitled somewhat tongue in cheek. We always hear from the few people who talk about Xunzi that he is the Chinese Aristotle. And I really think that um, I would like to think of Aristotle as the Greek Xunzi. And the problem I'm particularly interested in is enslavement of various sorts and privileges. Um, and the usual story, I almost think we don't have to go into it, is that Aristotle is the systematic universal philosopher, um, along with Plato, um, and that Chinese thinkers are not true philosophers because uh, they're only pragmatic uh, political theorists. Um, my story would be quite different. Um, I would like to say that of the two of the thinkers before me, Aristotle and Xunzi, on the single issue of enslavement and privileges for others, uh, Xunzi seems to me to be superior. And my suspicion is that that's because he's not living in, an, in a slave society. And so he doesn't have to skirt certain issues in particular ways. Um, let's remember that Aristotle is always trying to describe in both the politics um, and then um, if it is by Aristotle, the Athenian constitution and other works, what is, what he sees around him. And of course, what he sees around him in Athens is a highly stratified um, slave society. So um, what I want to uh, begin by arguing is, is the big picture. 
um, that for Aristotle, the thing that he must prove um, is that the highest form of ratiocination, of rational deliberation, takes place in the public sphere, um, and that defines the perfect citizen. Um, and so Aristotle does uh, very interesting things with um, the fact that the perfect citizen is at points ruled. And what I'm really interested in um, is exploring those things. Um, uh, and uh, recent work by Mirko Carnavaro uh, would very much complicate um, any reading of Aristotle that we have gotten from Josh Ober, because he says voting in the early period was mainly to ratify decisions uh, taken among the tribes. What I'd like to emphasize is that family life is relatively unimportant to Aristotle. Um, he pretty much tosses it off um, uh, because it has not for him an educative function. Um, 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 meanwhile, I would say Aristotle re never really manages to fully explain what the, how the polis educates the person, um, except perhaps in deliberate, uh, collaborative deliberations um, about public issues that this shows um, uh, maybe those who are less inclined to rationality, what rationality um, in the public sphere would look like. Um, so um, Aristotle's politics defines a constitution um, um, as a form of legitimate government, which must at a minimum have three discrete parts, a deliberative assembly of some sort, an executive or head of state of some sort, um, and laws and legislations and courts of law and juries, um, to which all must be subject if they're part of the community. And so in some sense, um, um, the implication is that the laws and legislation and courts of law and juries um, are the most fundamental of the three, um, because after all, the executive could be a monarch or many other types of leaders. Um, and so um, there's quite a lot of wiggle room in terms of what Aristotle's politics seeks to justify as a constitution. Um, what I got interested in was the backstory on Athenian and Spartan politics. Um, in order to achieve what we might call isonomic institutions, um, equal rights to a degree for all citizens to a degree, I, an important qualification, um, that massive social engineering was needed to completely excise old kinship ties. Um, so what instead uh, people were reorganized in these complicated voting tribes or deans, um, drawing people in gerrymandered ways from city, coast, and plains to be members of the new tribes. Um, so these were tribes or deems were to become hereditary. Um, and in a sense, they were to replace the more natural um, uh, communities of kin and professions um, in order to provide checks and balances. There's a sense in Aristotle, um, more than a sense as he says it explicitly, that every form of good constitution um, tends towards the bad very quickly. Um, if elaborate mechanisms are not put in place uh, to keep it on the straight and narrow. Um, I was thinking in the air, of course, this is much later, um, but I think these medical ideas can be traced back much later. So I just pulled one um, and I'd like us to look at uh, Asclep. Um, um, uh, that would be nothing is naturally in sympathy with anything else, all substance being divided and broken up in inharmonious elements and absurd molecules, okay? So if your constitution is based on nature where nothing is in sympathy and all is division, um, you have um, really to implement certain kinds of checks and balances. 
For Schwinza, deliberation is not just for and about the polis, okay? Rational deliberation inevitably must correlate a number of incommensurate goods from different communities um, as well as the personal. So the personal, the familiar, the political, all of which define the Junza, AKA um, the noble man, um, as the person capable of self-rule in any sphere. And by self-rule, um, Shunza definitely means balanced, temperate judgment. It's extremely important to realize that for Shunza, family life is just as important as official life, as our teachers in the educated function. And education is a lifelong, never ending process. As with Aristotle, the goal is always rational deliberation, which means the proper prioritizing of goals, because these goals, we have lots of goals in life. Um, I want to be liked and I want to be fair. Those are not always um, moving in the same uh, direction. Um, and so um, for Schunze, um, I think as for Aristotle, the desire to engage in rational deliberation is predicated on the emulation of social superiors, which becomes the driving force. It's just for Schunze, there are many more social superiors to contend with. The great divergence comes when Schunze insists that the cosmos is not the model for anything that takes place in the socio-political world. And that great divergence has enormous effects when we look at how they look at governing. For Schunze, surveying the Jungle statutes, I think that's statute, no, states, it's supposed to be, <laughs> wherein alien ministers move back and forth from successful courts to and from them, he focuses on two problems. And the first I would call in modern terminology, knowledge allocation. How do you manage to get from the populace um, the information that those who are leaders need in order to make the best um, assessment of how to proceed in policy making? Um, so I quoted here Hayek on the use of knowledge in society. Um, I think this is uh, something that Schunze um, is also talking about. Um, and the second problem is that Schwinza is intent upon solving is how to allow equally for both diversity and unity. And here, the modern theorist who reminds me most of Schwinza is Sheldon Wolin in Politics and Vision. How to reconcile um, the conflict created by competition under conditions of scarcity with the demands of public tranquility. And that's where harmony, concord, and security all come in. Um, I wanna just show you a map that I created um, from the Ijo Shu. So this is the theory of what the ideal Western Joe court looked like. Um, and what it is, and it's uh, repeated over and over in many other sources, including Shirji 30. Um, basically that many people face South and interestingly wore the pearl crown. In other words, that they too were ruling as emperors. Um, that while you can talk about the Tianzi, you really have to look at the body of his, um, his advisors um, to decide um, what policies are to be decided. Um, I give another quote that's in the air. I could have given it from the documents, but people are sick of me spouting the documents. Um, this is from Shirji 129, which begins and ends with references to Shunza. It is Shunza in the flesh talking about money making. Um, and what he has to say is that um, if the wealth becomes too great, um, people in the society respond in these very negative ways and ultimately become slaves. 
um, towards the people in power. Once people are enslaved rather than feeling they're participants in the society, then um, the knowledge is not going to flow up from the bottom uh, to the leaders. That's why this phrase um, is crucial to Shirji 129, but something I believe Shunza would absolutely subscribe to. Um, I want to say what's interesting to me is that women can be exemplars. We often forget that among the 10 sages identified in the Analects, um, uh, we have one woman. Uh, we often forget that in the Han period, uh, Ban Zhao was considered the chancellor um, in her own time. Uh, we often forget, too, that education can take place in any setting. We focus way too much on the teacher-disciple relation. Of course, that's significant. Um, but as important as that is for Shunza, he goes on to show us um, that people are taught by everything, including public spectacles. Um, so the, there are many, many, many ways that people are taught. Um, we also often forget that Xunzi insists that all people, in theory, can aim for rational deliberation, not just male citizens or not just male officials. Long-standing tradition, which Shunza cites, by the way, makes the fuel and fodder gatherers capable of providing good models for their social superiors. Everyone in the state, in theory, has unique experiences and insights. The problem is how to tap them um, and how to then, having tapped them, um, uh, devise rational policies for the benefit of those. Um, I want to just mention that in Shunza, the role of precedents and models for, um, for training is complex. We often think of precedents only in terms of legal and administrative models, but I put on the screen, as it were, um, just the beginning <laughs> um, of the sorts of things that can be cited in legal cases as precedents um, in the Han period. Um, so, um, rational deliberation over time brings exquisite sensibility to the question of what to do, with the sense of satisfaction coming from multiple occasions, not just political action, that contribute to a strong sense of community. And this can be easily seen by just reading the first couple of paragraphs of Shunza Li Lun chapter. I just wanted to show you um, two images that have educative functions, but we don't have time to go through those. Um, but definitely um, they are um, have their own messages to convey to those who would have seen them. Of course, uh, one is from Mawang Dui and one is from Eastern Han Luoyang. So both Aristotle and Shunza aim at a measure of self-rule. Um, and I think we've left this out of our definition of Junza. Um, uh, maybe we've implied it, but we've been thinking about top down. And what I think we need to be thinking about um, is how to people get to the point of self rule in community. Um, because in order to affect um, any rational, deliberate policy, there must be a harmony of wills. So for Aristotle, uh, self-rule is defined by episodic political action in the polis. And for Schwinza, self-rule is displayed in many more settings, including the domestic and in exile, whether self-imposed or not. So you can be completely um, having no access to official life um, and you can achieve self-rule. Um, both aim at a kind of equality, um, but for Aristotle, it's people with access to power compete and they compete always for more power. And so the system um, is liable to collapse. So equality must be carefully circumscribed. And, and so it was in Athens. <clears throat> 
Um, for Schwanza, there's a different kind of equality that pertains in communities that test each person's suitability for the status he or she has acquired by commonly agreed upon standards, not just the laws, um, but other kinds of testing within the community. Um, we have to remember that Schwanza every much, um, as um, every bit as much as Mencius, um, says that nobles must be removed from their positions if they don't act properly. Um, and by implication, um, since he says it should be the worthy man on the throne, uh, we can go even higher. Um, so for Aristotle, a type of unity is possible through public deliberation and action. In other words, all citizens eventually are harnessed to the same actions and the same notions of accountability. But for Schunze, one mind, I think, means something quite different. Everybody in the community will achieve this state only if the tasks to which they are set and the rewards which they gain from doing those tasks well are properly distributed, of course. He's talking ideal society here. Um, so anyway, um, um, I, I think I'm coming out of time pretty soon. Um, and um, the yes, crucial two thing, more minutes, Michael. OK, the crucial thing for Aristotle is that harmony must be, um, in some sense, natural. Um, and um, because he insists uh, that human societies are in um, microcosms of the macrocosms. Um, so um, the best people should lead, but there must be a resultant harmony of wills on the natural model. For Schwinze, that's much more complex. The sages invent civilization. It's not modeled on the cosmos. That requires much more sustained levels of commitments um, by those who engage in society and greater calls for social mobility. Um, so what? Isn't this all just theory anyway? Um, what about uh, what? Uh, who cares? Um, well, as I've tried to hint at various points, um, um, I don't think theory versus practice um, is the proper model when we're talking about politics. Um, theory and practice are embedded and entangled with theories affecting practices and local practices prompting new theories. Um, so anyway, I would like to stop there and be on time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah. Xiaoyun, would you like to give your comments on Michael's paper? Yes, uh, sure. So uh, uh, I'm going to try offering some, you know, not yet fully formed uh, thoughts and ideas inspired by Person Island's, uh, you know, very thought provoking paper. And uh, I need to, I need to first, um, you know, confess that Shinzo is probably the um, ancient Chinese philosopher that I least understand. Um, for many years, I avoided reading his work because um, his ideas are so complex. Um, so if uh, if I end up uh, misrepresenting or oversimplifying um, Shinzo's ideas, I, I do apologize. Um, but uh, I would like to, uh, you know, focus my comments on uh, the role of rational deliberation versus the role of careful emulation um, in Shinzo's thinking. Um, so it, it seems to me, uh, you know, based on what I know of Aristotle and what I know of Shinzo, um, which you know, again, it's not, it's not a whole lot, perhaps. Um, it seems to me that whereas Aristotle has faith uh, in educated citizens' capacity for collective rational deliberation, um, Shinza's faith, on the other hand, is in the morally transformative power of emulating one's moral betters, both in the present and in the past. Uh, and he calls this following um, teachers and proper models in Chinese, shifa. Uh, so for Shinzi, the, the Jinzi is a person who uses comprehensive learning of Washir to transform himself morally for, this, for the sake of attaining sagehood. But is this transformational education guided by his faculty of reason or logic or you know, rational deliberation as, um, the, as Person Island's paper um, calls it? Uh, you know, in other words, is the Tao of Shinzi's philosophy the same thing as the Greek logos 
my my reading of it uh, is that for Shunzi, sagehood is attained not by the effort of moral reasoning or rational deliberation, uh, but by the effort of learning to follow established models, rules, and precedents, mm -hmm. and using them to transform and override one's inborn nature. Um, which, you know, an inborn nature that Shinzo believes is driven by selfish desires rather than by proper moral reasoning. So to Shinzo, ordinary human beings are not capable of moral reasoning without reliance on external models established by earlier sages because their inborn nature gets in the way. But by relying on these models that the sages have established, they can become Shinzo and with enough effort even become sages. Then as sages, they can use their sagely powers of moral reasoning to establish models of their own with which to transform others. So, uh, you know, let me uh, just try quoting from uh, a couple of passages from the chapter, uh, Xing uh, human nature is, is bad. Um, and, and I believe this is, ugly. I'm using the Eric Hutton. Yeah, ugly oh. is what it, oh. it's always said, Bume, not excellent, ugly. Right, yeah. human nature is ugly, right? Um, I, I think I'm using the Eric Cotton translation here. But uh, so one passage that uh, I'm thinking about is this one. Uh, it says, the sage accumulates reflections and thoughts and practices deliberate efforts and reasoned activities in order to produce ritual and yi, the yi, and in order to establish proper models and measures. So ritual and yi and proper models and measures are produced from the deliberate efforts of the sage. They're not produced from people's nature. Um, and then the next passage um, that, I was thinking about is this one. Um, liking what is beneficial and desiring gain are people's inborn dispositions in nature. Suppose there were brothers who had some property to divide. So there's a hypothetical scenario here. And that they followed the fondness for benefit and desire for gain in their inborn dispositions in nature. Now, if they were to do so, then the brothers would conflict and contend with each other for it. They would fight over who gets more land, who gets more property. However, let them be transformed by the proper form and order contained in ritual and eat. If so, then they would even give it over to their countrymen. They would even you know, not keep any for themselves and give it to the state. Thus, following along with inborn dispositions in nature, even brothers will struggle with each other, right? So, you know, in other words, their, their reason is not going to be uh, any help in this regard. If transformed by ritual and E, then they will even give it over to their countrymen, right? But where does ritual and E come from, right? To my mind, it doesn't come, it doesn't come from moral reasoning that they are able to, uh, to perform because their, their nature basically gets in the way, right? The ritual and E comes from uh, models and precedents established by the sages. So, um, you know, let me continue. So for Aristotle, moral reasoning is the duty of every citizen, uh, whereas natural slaves lack the capacity for it. That is why they can't become citizens. Um, they're, not, they're not capable of that. Uh, for Shinza, moral reasoning is work that only the sage is capable of doing, because only the sage is fully free of his inborn nature. Everyone else left to his own devices is essentially a slave to his nature. Um, and so a society in which everyone reasons for himself would be a disharmonious one filled with conflict because every non-sage's reasoning will tend to lead toward the pursuit of self-interest. At least that is my reading of, uh, of what Shinzu thinks about that. Uh, and I'm happy to correct it. So instead of reasoning for ourselves, Shinzu suggests we should simply emulate the sages of both the past and the present until we have become sages ourselves. Um, so Aristotle is concerned most of all with building a stable, sustainable political community of equal free citizens in a self-governing city state. Uh, in book five of the politics, he argues that monarchies are only sustainable if their powers are limited rather than absolute because overpowerful monarchs will always arouse resistance from their subjects who recognize them as morally undeserving of such absolute power. Now, Shinza's vision of perfect community and order seems much more hierarchical and monarchical to me. Uh, with a selfless and truly morally superior, truly morally superior sage king holding and deserving supreme authority at its apex and serving as the one man engaged in rational deliberation or moral reasoning on everyone else's behalf. So the, the question that comes to mind uh, for me is, is that more actually like Plato's ideal of a philosopher king in the Republic than like anything in Aristotle's politics? Um, so that's that's the question that kind of like uh, is, 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 is in my mind and that, you know, I would love to hear person I thoughts on. Okay, so, first of all, um, thank you for those comments and you've given a perfect Neo-Confucian reading um, of um, Shunza. And I'm trying to give uh, what I think is um, a, a Han Dynasty reading. And what I mean by that 
is I think you see rituals as um, and precedents as set and fixed. Um, and what is argued over and over again in Han Dynasty is there's a huge body of rituals and precedents. And faced with exactly the same decision, uh, sages can go completely different ways, um, as they do in the Wades uh, chapter of the documents. So rational deliberation is needed um, always by people, and they're the way you don't get a, a uniform message from rituals, laws, the five classics, the masterworks, okay? So that would be the first thing I would say. And this is precisely why Ju Shi said, get rid of the five classics, um, because they give too many models. People are confused uh, by the multiplicity of models. Um, which from which they will have to choose. Okay, so that's problem number one. Problem number two is you note that even in the passage that you uh, quoted from Eric Hutton, he talks about rational deliberation. Um, so um, wait a minute, what are we talking about here? Um, what is uh, what somebody has to do? I think the difference is again, you've given the Neo-Confucian model of the sage the sage who's reached a plane of being after which he never has to think again. That's not what any of the early texts are describing. In fact, they focus on all the difficulties that even those sages had in determining policy. And therefore that's why they had um, to gather information from many others to be sure as to what was in all likelihood um, the best policy. Zhou Gong is confused in the documents. King Wu is confused in the documents. Um, all of the those in supreme power. So Xunzi says at one point, and this is crucial, that the ruler, and I forget whether he says the Renju or the Tianzi, I'll have to go back and look, um, never makes a move without consulting his officers. Um, though he can walk on his own, he would not proceed on his own, okay? So um, I think you've given a perfect Neo-Confucian account um, of both the sage and of ritual as a fixed body from which one must, to which one owes obedience. Um, the other thing is that I think, and this will be my last point, again, you think of Shurfa as describing only an allegiance to a single teacher, but Shofuin and I have done a lot of work on the term Shurfa um, in the context of writing pieces together, and all kinds of people can be um, um, identified as advisors and consultants of the worthy sort. So I think um, one, the language changes over time. And I think in many ways, the Neo-Confucian construction is much more top down because families themselves are much more top down. So it replicates what is, being reorganized in society. I don't think Zhu Xi comes out of nowhere. Um, but in Han times, we have a very different um, thing. For example, women can be heads of households. Um, and even as late um, as the Song, women can register votes in a referendum um, as Shofuin and I are writing about. So again, I think our picture has been far more limited. Um, and um, what we need to do is read these texts um, in their time period. If I'm gonna talk about Aristotle, even within the citizens, there's a huge division between those who can vote and possibly vote to ratify previous decisions um, versus those who have wealth qualifications and can stand for office. Um, so there, this is hierarchical too, um, and you can't tell me a slave society isn't hierarchical. So the point is all, all complex societies are hierarchical. Um, one needs to decide 
how are they hierarchically arranged and how much social mobility is provided for. Um, and I would say there's much more up and down mobility based on the limited evidence at hand uh, for the early period um, than for some times and later. So, but thank you for those comments because those are the objections. I'm going to have to um, argue more successfully against. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael and Xiao Yun. And now we can move on to the second paper by Cho Fu Yin of the University of British Columbia. And the paper is entitled Liu Bei, Plato, and et al. on the state, a micro history of 17th century globalization and political thought. Cho Fu Yin, the floor yeah, you, is yours. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to share my screen first. Let me try. Can I do it? Uh, do you, ah, yes. Um, have yes. I managed? Let me yeah make the yeah. screen um, proper. Yeah, it's a great honor um, to be um, presenting here, especially after uh, Professor Nyland and Professor Yang's wonderful dialogue. This is an excellent, extraordinary, and of course, exemplary comparative work. So I'm mm -hmm. going to continue by offer a crappy and a crazy kind of comparison. <laughs> so between Liu Bei on the one hand, this is from Total War Street Kingdoms, and Plato, on the other hand, I think the image is kind of showing you how crazy it is. On the one hand, a politician, a warlord, third century is China. On the other hand, a philosopher of all times. So if some students, after hearing some wonderful comparative work, come to you, teachers, hey, please, I want to compare these two guys. Our gut intuition is probably what? How can they be compared? So my entry point is to focus on a particular person, and Domingo Navalete, and who is a Spanish Dominican, a thinker, a philosopher, I shall argue, who spent years in Mexico, in the Philippines, in China. Now, after this worldwide travel, he came back to um, Spain and formed, um, 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 became important in Rome, and then was appointed um, to Santo Domingo in Latin America and died there. So 1676, so he published this book um, about China, um, definitely, but it's also about many important things. We can do a quick kind of cover analysis. So in the end, it is about religiosos de la monarquia de China. And it's often read as a mere book about China, about religion, but I'm also going to show what is a cover shows, what is really important to tratados históricos, políticos, éticos. So it is a treatise, focusing on history, using history to address important issues in politics and ethics. So my basic argument today, um, I'm going to focus on a small passage, actually two passages in this, well, wonderful book. This book also discussed Tang Taizong, uh, um, his statecraft, Professor Devel um, has wonderfully shown us in her works, in her lectures. I'm going to focus on only one page where he compares Liu Bei and Plato in a semi-crazy way. Um, my argument, my proposal is that it's not only entertaining, but also productive to engage that because it embodies a pioneering approach to global political thought. By which I mean, I'm borrowing uh, from Lubna El Amine, it is an approach that seeks to go beyond the East-West divide and to address globally shared conditions that regimes, cultures of different traditions are all facing. Of course, this is 17th century. To be more specific, so um, and to anticipate a little bit, his argument is rather starting from Thomism, King's two bodies, if we want. The sovereign is the soul of two bodies, his natural bodies subject to disease and death is a symbolic political body that is a polity itself. So later in Tudor context, King's two bodies we are familiar with, but Navalete has his own unique proposal, uh, proviso, that is, if that is the case, then the king's pain must be twofold. The natural pain comes from disease, natural disease itself, but the political pain will be resulted from the injustice of the reign, about the polity. And he is, by incorporating Liu Bei, he was making a very important argument, the sovereign's ability to feel the proper pain, the political pain is of pivotal importance. 
So my goal today is to show that by incorporating Liu Bei or a Chinese, imagine a Chinese tradition into this long lasting dialogue, Navalete has a genuine point to contribute to the issue of body politics, mainly for today. Implicitly, uh, through my dialogue, I also want to share with you a little bit Navalette, not only as a European thinker, but also as a global reader of Liu Bei's statecraft, along with these Persian guys, Ottomans, Manchus, Koreans. Um, yeah, if possible, I'd li like to write a book around that. So it's about how the death of Liu Bei becomes a starting point for different political theorization. Yeah, that's the plan. Um, first of all, I'm introducing you a little bit about uh, Navalete. So I am in Vancouver in the middle. So he started in North Spain and studied there, wrote as a university lecture, deciding that it, uh, this career is not interesting stuff enough. So um, he traveled around the world. So he went to Mexico first. And there he examined, um, um, uh, trying to understand what is going wrong with the Spanish empire. And then he went to the Philippines, lectured there, theology, philosophy, and then um, went to China for a while and then coming back. Given the limit of time, I, I, I shall not delve into further details. The only thing I want to show is that a lot of documents related to his travels are highly illustrative. So this is one of the examples about, and uh, this is 1677. So after he published that book, before he going to uh, Latin America. It is a record of travel about how to embark on a ship. What are you going to do? It's more or less like visa passport of our own times, but it's highly illustrative of the kind of early globalization. He was talking about sickness of his assistant. So sickness is a constant theme throughout his travel. He's talking about delays. If I were sick, how can I catch the next ship? He is also talking about what the king has granted to bishops. In a certain sense, the rights of bishops in such a kind of global empire. And in his vision, it is of pivotal importance to the health of the regime. And in the end, it's the most formulaic expression you can find in all kinds of these petitions, that is, pido justicia, I plead justice. And this kind of petition, official document writing, and the theme of justice is actually a very important theme throughout a later analysis. So I shall um, end up here, um, 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 embarking ourselves onto the Liu Bei story. On the right side, it is Navalete in Spanish. On the um, left side, well, you see the image. Uh, I, I, I just briefly introduce you the story. So this is a Liu Bei. Liu Bei by then is 60-ish. By the way, this is um, Navalete here when he was 60-ish. So Liu Bei is dying. And, and, and so there's a very worthy counselor, Zhuge Liang, is next to him. He was telling Zhuge Liang, hi, I'm going to die. And I have a son. You know, he is silly. If he is good, then um, worth of your assistance, then assist him. If he is not that good, well, you just take his place, right? We are more or less familiar with that story. And of course, Zhuge Liang say, no, 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 I, I, I will be loyal. And Liu Bei told his son, yeah, be a good guy. This is by and large the story. Uh, interesting for us is the uh, source of information. So um, by and large, um, well, I'm 99% sure about that. So this is a book, 1541 print, it's a main print. This one survived in uh, nowadays in Spain and uh, next to Madrid. This is a royal collection, um, Shao Wei Tong Jian Jie Yao. It is a highly influential book in the kind of coastal area of Fujian, Zhejiang, where Navalete belabored, but it's also um, still in the kind of, um, 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 in, in Spain. So I can, no evidence, I, I have not identified concrete evidence that Navalete has actually tapped this book, utilized this book, now sitting on the shelf in Spain. But I'm 99% sure that all the kind of narrative that uh, Navalete presented as intended is more or less in congruence, conformity with this narrative. So an example of how literal Navalete's translation is, in Shao Wei Tong Jian Jie Yao, so Liu Bei has a saying that if you are good, people will follow you. So this Fu in Chinese has a relatively wide semantic spectrum, right? As a people, you can convince other people, other people will trust you, et cetera. So Navalete is offering a very literal translation in the sense that others will surrender, a very a more forceful kind of, a more hierarchical reading of um, that line. I'm showing the Manchu version only to stress that um, the Spanish guy is not idiosyncratic. It's not wrong in reading that. I don't mean that um, Navalete read Manchu, he didn't, but basically it's a kind of hard reading that means to make as a submit 
as a kind of a literal reading that is also seen elsewhere 17th century. This is a basic point about a very literal translation. Based on that, it is worth noting that there are at least two, what well, one places he definitely got it wrong. So Liu Bei says, I, my concern, Shao Wei Tong Jian Jie Yao is my concern as Qin Xiong Di, as you brothers. So it's his actual song. But the Spanish friar reinterpreted that, no, uh, my, my, my concern is my subjects and the subjects as my brothers. You can see a Christian language, Catholic language there, an idealization of Liu Bei. From someone who cares about his family, and um, reinterpreting as someone only cared about his subjects who are his brothers. Another interesting episode is that um, in, in Shao Wei Tong Jin Jie, the Chinese sources, Zhuge Liang is presented, well, treat him as a father. So nevertheless, is over-interpreting that, treat him as a counselor, as a friend, and as a father. So the emphasis of friendship is important and worth our attention for many reasons. In the European context, anti-Machiavellianism, new stoicism, Lipsius, that Navalidis cited, friendship pivotal importance. Friendship is also important for the Jesuits, the, uh, the, the missionaries program to reach out to Chinese elites. So uh, Matteo Ricci, um, Martino Martini, they published upon friendship. And it's also important thing uh, lately in uh, intellectual landscape. And um, yesterday we talked about Li Zhi on friendship, more kind of um, anti-conventional as Lu Liu Liang, we can discuss that a little bit. And also local Chinese, and um, this is Zhu Zongyuan. Zhu Zongyuan discussed friendship as well, synthesizing Christian and late Ming sources, um, well, uh, resources, and Navalette actually cited him, uh, cited the Chinese writing of Zhu Zongyuan into the European debates. So friendship is a kind of connecting point, a lot of intellectual currents coming together. Also interesting is Navalette, after introducing Liu Bei, says, wait a minute, let's pause a minute. Let's think about a minimal pensamiento. So he is referring to us, us to a certain book. Let's read this book. So I actually find that it is a biblical commentary, um, 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 the passage on the, uh, 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 on the left. So it's actually a, a, a biblical exegesis of Psalm 75, 11-ish. So the basic point is that in this psalm, um, human thoughts, ideas, is divided into two kinds, those directly in praise of God, those otherwise. The commentary is saying for those who are just, even those are thoughts who, that is not in praise of God directly, however small it is, it pleases God. So we can tell often well, how Navalete is intended um, um, his passage to be read, right? After you hear Liu Bei's story, certain comparisons, you pause a minute, you think about how these minimal thoughts as Liu Bei is advising to his son can be pleasing to God, a full pause. And then he starts his comparison. That's about the main topic today. This is a text. Instead of reading that, I just want to show you first the structure, the beauty. So he starts by comparing Liu Bei with uh, Saint Louis, king of France, and then moved to Plato, and then Seneca, and, and Saint Thomas. The structure behind, starting with a pagan king and a Catholic king, and then a pagan king with pagan philosophers, and in the end, a pagan king with Catholic philosopher, Thomas Aquinas. We can appreciate the beauty, the design of the structure, right? Uh, three layers, fantastic. So the comparison with, uh, between Liu Bei and Saint Louis is more or less kind of straightforward. So this comes from um, Saint Louis and enseignement teaching to his son. So do good things, love your neighbor. So there's a natural, a more or less obvious connection there. And then let's delve into Plato and Seneca. Um, reading the text, you might get the impression that, aha, Navalete, um, he read a lot of classical pagan authors. That's not true. All his kind of Greco-Roman citations come from one single citation book, I should not call that, comes from one monograph, that is Lipsius. That is more or less a statecraft book, Mirror for Princes, but more or less composed of his illustration integral with citations of ancient authors. So this is an example. He was saying, I have a point, my point is monarchy is the greatest. Well, Asian authors agree with me. And then he cited Plato. And this is also an example, even though Lipsius is a renowned humanist, classical scholar, Catholic of that time, the entire book is well received in Spain in particular, but the entire book is a kind of fabrication of Greek Roman authors. So he was kind of faking the actual expressions from Plato. 
So Plato was saying ex bon, which is true, meaning that a good polity is distinguished, a perfect polity is distinguished from the rest as if a god is distinguished from the people. He is saying nothing like the king is a god among men. So this is a example of how he invented things. Seneca, another example. So uh, Lipsius is known for um, a Seneca editor, publisher, scholar, and this is another example. He was ascribing to Seneca a certain phrase like via piety and justice, princes become gods. Sounds cool, but it's entire uh, uh, Lipsius kind of uh, uh, invention. The text is Seneca apocolokintosis. So idea, um, as, as, as the word indicates, is a satire. So it's a kind of satire of the idea of apotheosis becoming gods, a Roman emperor becoming a divus after his death. But to make fun of that, he was saying becoming pumpkins, right? Uh, goods. Um, so a, 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 an emperor after his death, he turned into a pumpkin-ish. So it's intended as a satire, intended to satire the certain style of speech of Augustus. So Augustus in that was saying, after becoming gods, I, I did not say anything. That is, um, suppose the, the piety, justice, prudence, etc. So these two examples shows how um, Lipsius invented ancient maxims. And these maxims are unfortunately cited by Navarrete. But Navarrete was using them to advance a genuine argument once we see how these citations are connected to the point of Aquinas. So this is a famous passage of um, 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 Aquinas um, becoming the kind of seedbed of later theorization, King's Two Bodies in Kyoto, England. Basically, it is saying that a king is like the soul in the body and is like the God in the world. This creates the problem, right? What does that mean? What it will actually entail? So Tudor England come to its king's two bodies, we are more or less familiar. And Domingo Navalete offers a different interpretation. As an agent, as a soul, as a sentient being. So he is thus subject to two kinds of feelings. What is truly emphasized by Domingo Navarrete is Liu Bei dying, he is suffering a lot from his physical body, a dimension that Chinese sources, Manchu sources tend to overlook. He was really suffering from the natural pain. But what Liu Bei was able to do is not setting aside that, but rather to feel more from the political pain, from the injustice afflicting the domain, the polity. And here we see Thomism, new Aristotelian ethics is there. So virtue is not self-control. Virtue is not that feeling pain in a certain way, but setting them aside, pursuing righteous things, but rather to feel rightly, feel more from the political pain, even than the bodily pain. And this is what I mean, the Navalletes proviso to the problem of body politic. I'd like to stress that Navalette is not the only person in the 17th century who utilized Liu Bei to um, offer a radical or a very interesting political theorization. This is Cho Chen Han, slightly earlier than um, Domingo Navalette. He was doing something else, not translation, but imitative drafting. This is more my book manuscript from my dissertation. So he was required to recrafting a document on behalf of Liu Bei when he was dying. So he was saying, he was reinventing a philosophy via Liu Bei's voice that the righteous way, the proper way of governing a polity is passing the rule, rulership, the entire polity to the worthy. And yesterday we hear from Sarah Allen, and, and this idea is buried underground for 2000 years ish. It is not transmitted, at least in China. I mean, 17th century, these rhetoricians, these trainees, these scholars, reading Liu Bei's story was reinventing the idea. The superior virtue is to pass the kingdom to the worthy, not to yourself. So this is the point of recapitulation. So this is a micro history, not of a book, not a person, but even a passage. So we are trying to emulate literary critiques, philologists, book historians, but trying to show how this approach can be productive. Central to my argument is that it is productive to compare Spanish political thought not only to their British, um, later English counterparts like Hobbes, like from the lens of 18th, 19th century Europe. It is also productive to read it from the lens of global connections with China. 
And we present Navalette not as a mere kind of traveler, ethnographer, proto sinologist but a genuine philosopher. And we placed him in the broader context of global readership of Liu Bei. In the end, it is an invitation to further inquiry, thanks to which we might realize one day that the Castilian Catholic Chinese Chosong political thought might be even richer and more diverse than previously assumed. Thank you so much. Let me end here. Thank you very much, Shouhuin. And then we can have comments from Xiao Yun. Right. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I want to start by saying that I, I really enjoyed reading uh, Professor Yin's uh, paper. Uh, you know, I was just uh, just intrigued by how uh, you, you can trace uh, the influence of this one uh, of this text or the influences that it had. You know, across across not just text, you know, the, not not just intertextually, but also between uh, across languages and across countries um, in such a global way. So, you know, I think I think that approach is just really promising. And uh, I look forward to seeing more of it in Professor Yin's work. Um, so th there was something in the in the Professor Yin's paper that uh, was not in the presentation, um, and and that I would like to kind of draw attention to, uh, and that is the the kind of political or political historical context in which um, you know uh, Navarrete seized upon the um, story of Liu Bei's last words, so to speak, um, and sort of like used that as uh, a trope to make a certain argument. About politics, um, and so as I said, it's mentioned in the in the paper, but uh, I I do not believe it was in the presentation. So it might be interesting to the audience and also the person um, to have to to for me to share some thoughts about that. So essentially, what is happening here is that this is 1676, um, and Navarrete uh, it, it seems to me, and uh, I'm not the first person to have suggested this. I think uh, there was a previous study of Navarrete's work um, cited by Presidian that had uh, suggested this as well, is that the Navarrete was using Liu Bei's words to Zhuge Liang and to his son, right, to express support for the idea of John Joseph of Austria, um, also known in Spanish as Don Juan Jose, right, to launch a palace coup to end the regency of Charles II's mother, Mariana, right? So Charles II has just died um, and his son has um, become king, but the son is too young. And so the, 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 the queen mother is essentially um, running the place uh, along with one of her favorites. Uh, so uh, John Joseph opposed uh, Mariana's regency, right? And had political ambitions of his own. So as, as uh, Professor Yin mentions in his paper, the Tratados, right? This text by Navarrete is dedicated to none other than this guy, John Joseph, this guy who uh, is on the verge of launching a palace coup in Spain. So in early 1677, John Joseph did lead such a coup. He expelled the queen mother Mariana and he made himself prime minister of Spain. Uh, but he failed to reverse the Spanish Empire's decline, and he died just two years later. So it essentially kind of like really came to nothing, which is why nobody remembers him today, I suppose. Um, but Navarrete, by um, you know just uh, playing up the example of Liu Bei and praising it in this way, was effectively likening um, John Joseph to Zhuge Liang, and implying that uh, you know John Joseph would be justified in assuming the same loyal fatherly role towards the young, weak, and sickly. Charles II. So, uh, sorry, I, I, I misspoke just now. Charles II is the new king, right? And the, the previous king, I forget his name, but uh, the young, weak, and sickly new king under the, the uh, influence or under regency of Mariana is Charles II. Uh, now, John Joseph is the half brother, the half brother of Charles II. He's the illegitimate son of the previous king, right? So, he's not, he's not entitled to succeed. Um, but uh, basically, uh, Navarrete is saying that he can be. Charles II's Zhuge Liang, right? The same role that Zhuge Liang assumed towards Liu Shan, the son of Liu Bei. So the interesting difference here is that Liu Bei gave Zhuge Liang explicitly authority to take the throne for himself if necessary, if Liu Shan proves to be, you know, not fit for the job. Whereas Philip, so this is the, the king before Charles II, the, the father of both John Joseph and Charles II, Philip the, um, the fourth, right? Whereas Philip the fourth entrusted the regency to his queen, Mariana, and a committee of ministers, and pointedly excluded his ambitious, illegitimate son, John Joseph, from that committee, right? It's like, no, you're not gonna be on that, right? So Navarrete's high praise of Liu Bei can actually be read as a veiled criticism of Philip the, the Fourth for not behaving in a similarly public spirited way and entrusting power to someone who was more worthy of it, John Joseph, right? So, you know, it is really complicated. I, I, hope, I hope that the audience is actually following 
uh, the logic here. Um, but essentially, uh, you know, what, what I would add is that I'm still not sure, you know, after, after thinking about this whole situation um, and this context, that one can actually read more into this and, and take Navarrete's interpretation of Liu Bei as a statement of political thought, right? And, I, you know, I, I would be really uh, interested in hearing more about you know how uh, you kind of balance the immediate political agenda behind this use of Liu Bei and the, the kind of broader political argument that might be that Liu Bei might be uh, you know used to make in this text uh, was that rather really making a point about the king's two bodies and uh, you know two kinds of pain as uh, Professor Yin uh, was suggesting and even likening Liu Bei to Jesus which again is not in the presentation but I think um, that was that point made in in the paper that uh, you know Liu Bei is kind of like a Jesus figure in this this telling of the story, right? Uh, you know, it seems to me uh, at least you know that Navarrete found you know he simply found a story from Chinese history that could serve to provide moral justification, right, for what John Joseph was going to do to say that you know God is going to be pleased by by uh, you know taking power away from the queen uh, and holding it in your hands. Um, so quoting Plato and Seneca uh, as well as the Bible, you know might have just been icing on the cake to demonstrate Navarrete's authority as a scholar, right, while he was doing this, much as the Chinese literatus would quote the LX or the Menchus, right? So you know, I, I have to admit that in this passage of these, I don't see him, I don't see Navarrete engaging through kind of comparative philosophy or political philosophy. You know, um, I, I, I've, I don't see any serious engagement with the kind of Confucian ramifications of Liu Bei's instructions to, to Zhuge Liang and to Liu Shan. So I mean, I, I still have doubts about whether this is kind of comparative philosophy in the vein of what Matteo Ricci was doing, you know, some, a little before this with, you know, uh, Greek philosophy and Confucian philosophy, for example. So uh, I'll leave it at that. But you know, I would love to hear more. Yeah, this is fantastic, um, Professor Yang. Thank you so much. Yeah, super uh, illuminating. I think there are um, two threads, right? Um, the last one is about um, how thick. Um, we want it to be so as to say it is um, comparative. I think that is a very productive question. Um, um, we can discuss that further. But I want to um, go back to the very important threat about the entire um, 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 tratados as a kind of um, speech act in a very Skinnerian sense. Because one possibility following Cummings is to offer a very kind of Skinnerian reading, right? The entire tratados is a kind of specific political move. As dedicated to Don Juan, and as um, as Cummings has already emphasized, at um, set as, what was it? He achieved his goals, right? Establishing a concrete kind of relationship with Don Juan, especially after the good era. And this can be compared, um, as the paper alludes to, on the one hand, a Skinner's study of Hobbes in the entire Leviathan itself, right, um, can be read as a very kind of factional kind of a political action embedded uh, uh, in a certain kind of uh, 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 battles between the English crown and the parliament. So citing that as a purpose, it shows that the text has a concrete political purpose, does not negate that it can have very profound, thick, interesting political ideas in that. And um, going back to your earlier question is about what kind of form of thought we want. Do we really need a kind of commentarian style, argumentative style, or certain kind of um, 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 a postulating of ideas, mentioning names can embody certain thoughts in a certain way that remain underappreciated. That goes to Cho Chan Han's example as well, because that is another form of thinking, another genre of text that is rhetorical writing, imitative drafting, mere performance, emulating a certain literary style, literary training. So I will be arguing that um, Navalete, this kind of um, more casual name dropping, this kind of writing, Cho Chan Han rhetorical training, and Hobbes, um, Leviathan, definitely a philosophical treatise, all of which have concrete factional politics behind. And interestingly, Cho Chan Han was facing the same problem as, as a um, Guang Hai Jing period. So they are facing the same problem of deposing someone, Gu De Da, and they are problemizing an interesting issue. Um, we might say constitutional crisis. Under worst circumstance, we can suspend the power uh, of the monarch, or we can call the primogeniture as a principle into question. So all these three kind of cases, they share the same kind of context, political context, and they can all be read 
as a political action in favor of certain party or part faction against another. And this is extremely interesting. And thank you so much for offering this wonderful lucid introduction for the politics. Up to that point per se, I struggle with that a lot. So I was trying to read as much as possible because this is a very sick book. I mean, Navalete, Tratados, right? A very sick book. And this is one episode. Kunming's is interested in linking um, the Tang Taizong story um, to the Spanish politics. In a certain sense, every episode that we practice that approach of reading can be interlinked to Spanish politics in a certain way. And then the question will be a methodological one. What guides our this very creative contextualization if the passage is tenuous? So um, um, as you mentioned, I put that into a footnote and I didn't um, expound that. But in the future, when I continue the research, I probably can address that in a more kind of comparative framework, especially the succession crisis that Cha Chan Han was facing, the succession crisis, Gudeta, that you have wonderfully described in Navalette's context. And they are using Liu Bei in that case for a similar purpose. Methodologically, I was wondering whether this kind of comparison can shed further light on previous methodological conundrums. Yeah, this is a very long way of thank you for your very illuminating and ins insightful suggestion and guidance. Thank you so much. And we can move on to our last but not least paper by Trenton Wilson from Yale University, uh, reading Qinghui, reading Zhang Taiyan, reading Chinese institutional history, the question of Tu. Okay, um, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? I'll yes. Share my, okay, I'll share my screen. Okay. All good. Okay, so um, yeah, this. Thank you um, again for sticking around till the end of the day, or the middle of the day, or wherever you are. <laughs> um, it's really exciting to be here, and I feel um, I've somewhat taken advantage of this opportunity opportunity to spoil myself by pursue, pursuing a kind of bibliographical question to the ends of the world. <laughs> um, this the sort of core of this, as we'll see in a second, um, emerged in the process of writing about um, the institutional history and the intellectual history of the Qin and Han period for my thesis. But in the course of reading about, um, especially Chinese language takes on institutional history and the methods of doing institutional history, I kept coming across a, a theme, um, which is the nature of the relationship between institutions and individuals, uh, especially the persistent theme of selfishness and um, the independence of autonomous selves as being a key problem for Chinese institutional history. So there really is, um, as the title implies, sort of layered readings, um, reading one person, reading another person, reading um, you know, the nature of institutional history. Um, and so that's what I am going to try to explore um, some of the issues involved in this in this presentation. So we're going to cover um, quite a bit of uh, terrain, but hopefully um, for the purpose of getting at some of the possibilities available in thinking about this intersection between institutional history and political theory, um, drawing and thinking about how these conversations are happening in, a, in an imminently global setting in the late 19th and early um, 20th century and indeed up till today. Um, I think that sort of covering all these different aspects from scholars of institutional history to Nietzsche to Montesquieu will be um, hopefully interesting and illuminating. Um, but I want to do something that I wouldn't do, um, especially as an ancient historian, which is to begin this talk as um, with what I'm calling the wedge. So thinking about a xiezi from um, Chinese th theater, sort of this sort of um, interlude or a set piece that somehow brings out the themes of the talk, but is not, you know, um, part of the talk per se. Um, so I, I will start with this and then we'll leave it um, where we'll, I'll, I'll set it aside and sort of hopefully that some of the questions that I think are implicitly raised in this um, this wedge will um, reappear throughout the conversation. So I want to start by sort of saying um, maybe too emphatically um, that one of the um, 
enduring tropes of modern Chinese political banter, that is contemporary Chinese political banter, is the confident assertion by a Chinese person that Chinese people in general are too benighted for certain political forms or freedoms, and the equally confident assertion that that speaker himself or herself is not one of those benighted Chinese people. A spoken, um, often spoken, sometimes unspoken assertion is that I can be trusted, but everyone else deserves our suspicion. And um, there are lots of things. I think that this particular mode of speech can be traced um, certainly back to the, to the late Qing moment. Um, and so there are lots of examples that we could raise, but I wanna raise, I wanna to point to an example from um, a conversation that I had with um, mainland Chinese students at the Linen Wall um, on the campus of UC Berkeley in August, 2018, in the midst of the Hong Kong um, student movement. And um, it was a very interesting conversation because um, it, the conversation began as I was walking out of campus and I saw students tearing down Hong Kong students posters um, and um, notes from the linen wall. And so I walked over and said, you know, what's, what's going on? Um, why, why are you tearing down people's um, stuff? And then this it, it initiated a very interesting conversation about um, about the protests, about politics. Um, so there's sort of three statements that I um, wrote in notes shortly after this, or immediately after the conversation a few years back um, that, uh, that sort of stuck with me as interesting takes by what I thought was going to be a sort of very patriotic education um, that I would receive in this conversation. Um, so the first of these was, the first of these statements was that, um, that really the, the reason for um, dealing with the Hong Kong students in this way wasn't because of Hong Kong per se, but because it needed to show um, a sense of unity and strength to mainland Chinese who would otherwise be um, eager to protest for themselves if, you know, if this defiance wasn't met with um, suppression. Um, second, I sort of asked the students um, that, you know, their students studying in Berkeley, surely they, um, um, are accessing information that is not allowed in mainland China and mainland Chinese media, and so that they should be, you know, sympathetic to the idea that that there should be an open um, speech environment. Um, to which they said that they're educated and have the ability to discriminate, um, whereas you know many Chinese folks are not of high suzhi, and so the media in China has to be censored. Um, then most interestingly, um, we sort of got into non-Hong Kong specific things and we got into the question of changing the constitution um, to which the students, these erstwhile patriots responded that um, Xi Jinping had no choice but to amend the constitution. Um, and this particular student said that his dad had, does business in Fujian and everyone there knows how corrupt she was. So if he didn't amend the constitution, his own career would be on the line um, after the fact. So there's, there's a number of interesting things here about you know, the relationship between um, judgments about the nature of Chinese political institutions, um, Chinese, um, uh, Chinese, the nature of um, Chinese, uh, of Chinese culture and such that are all, all sort of implying a certain vision of what is possible and what's not possible in terms of politics. And I think that this, this mode of, um, I mean, every, everyone in different ways or, or um, different cultures are you know, participating in this, but it's, it's interesting to sort of reflect on what exactly is the um, relationship between these um, assumptions about the legacy of a people or the legacy of an institutional culture and what that implies for the possibilities for the present and the future. So this brings us to, so I'm gonna set that aside and. Um, we can return to it or not return to it as the case may be, but I, um, this, this debate is part of, or this discussion is part of a sort of high level um, discussion of the history of Chinese institutions um, that I sort of discovered in the course of my research. So I'll begin with um, this book, this really excellent book by Ho Xu Dong on favoritism um, as a way of getting at the role of trust in ruler-minister relationships in the Western Han Dynasty. Um, 
uh, so I'm not going to deal with the, the specifically early Chinese aspect of this, but sort of the historiographical um, assumptions of how one goes about doing institutional history. And so there's been a number of, the, Ho Xi Dong's um, um, writing has inspired a number of conferences in mainland China, um, speaking specifically, not so much about the, um, the Western Han history per se, but about the way he has this methodological breakthrough about how to do institutional history. And um, from this particular text, his breakthrough looks like a um, sort of a hermeneutic of suspicion. So that really, you know, institutions are not to be understood in terms of laws and norms, but they're to be understood in terms of um, the personal private relationships that um, obtain between political actors, especially between the emperor and his favorites. Um, and so he says in this very interesting passage here that, um, that we have to be suspicious of any claims made in the histories themselves that are about anything except um, these personal relationships, because even when ministers are speaking in terms of virtue or whatever, that they're actually just trying to win over imperial favor. So everyone is in this game and that even by claiming you're not in this game is a way of playing the game. So Ho Xi Dong makes two sort of key, um, uses two, um, two sets of terms to get at this um, that, ha that are actually quite um, important in the last hundred years of, of Chinese institutional history and debates about the nature of Chinese institutions as I'll show um, in a moment with Zhang Taiyan. Um, the first opposition that he builds up is this opposition between guanxi and shiti. So the opposition between relation and substance. So um, the key being that he's going to replace this emphasis on substantive, inst what he's calling substantive institutional history. So offices and rules and norms and duties with um, personal relationships. So this implies the second set of terms, um, which is this distinction between field a chang. Um, and a vortex, the Xuan Wu. So he explicitly says in this context that um, you know we shouldn't think of Chinese political space as a field with clearly defined sp uh, space, um, but rather as a vortex uh, that pulls people in and spits people out, um, that spins around where there are no enduring groups, Chun Ti, and there are no enduring cliques, and that all relationships are um, ephemeral and temporal and um, temporary. So um, this, there was a, a re review of Ho Xi Dong's book called Zou Chu Feng Bi De Zheng Zhi Shi, um, published on um, Peng Pai Ximen by um, someone going under the name Lao Wang Zi, who drew out the, the, dis the distinction between these two with these two images that the, the political history we need to escape is the one on the left where we have um, people who are, you know, acting in a certain space that is well-defined. Um, and we need to think about political space uh, uh, in terms of what, in terms of the right, um, that there are all of these different vortexes spinning and people are getting pulled and pushed um, by these multiplicity of vortexes. Um, so this, so this idea, so if you sort of scratch the surface and, and Ho Xi Dong is citing much of his other scholarship too, um, you can build up this very interesting portrait of, of a hundred or more, year, more years worth of scholarship um, that, um, that privileges the private self as actually the key to understanding everything about Chinese political history. So, I'm going to be talking about um, Qin Hui and Zhang Taiyan in, in particular because the debate um, or Qin Hui's criticism of Zhang Taiyan is sort of symptomatic of this larger discussion, but you can see these sorts of, this sort of thing showing up um, everywhere. So um, for instance, in Xu Fu Guan's Intellectual History of the Western Eastern Han, he says um, specifically that the psychology of despots past and present is that um, because they think of the realm as their own personal estate, they feel that politics is the capture of human and material resources for the sake of their own security, wealth, and glory, and they don't feel they bear any responsibilities to the people. Hence, they always look at offices through the lens of power and never through the lens of duty and responsibility. 
since they view it through the lens of power, they see the objectification of officialdom as objectified power. So, so any move made within this, um, uh, the argument that Xu Fuguan is making goes is that any move made within the um, within an institution um, can't be um, any claim that's based on virtue or duty or responsibility is actually a claim to power, and that claim to power is a threat to the uh, despot or the ruler. So what I say um, before Xu Fuguan, Xu Fuguan actually cites this uh, Japanese scholar says that this. Um, this dynamic explains the rippling cycle of Chinese bureaucratic history in which um, the ruler in which the ruler um, tries to find a way to inhibit the um, independence of the bureaucracy by building up new offices that then um, will eventually become independent themselves and require this the cycle to continue. Now Zhang Taiyan was a um, early 20th century um, proponent of this view, and he's often cited as the originator of this view, um, because in his Guantong from 1915, which he was working on for many years before this, but the book um, was certainly finished by 1915, um, says that um, the ruler hated those who were esteemed and respected because they would impinge on the ruler. And so that's why he would employ favorites, and then this cycle would continue. Okay, so, so for so there are different ways in which this basic idea of selfish suspicion can imply things about the nature of political order, or what's possible in Chinese political order. Um, and John Taiyan provides a very interesting um, reading of this because he, he leans into it completely. And even in his earlier period where he was um, working with the reformers in the um, in the late Qing, he was still um, a very strong advocate of this idea of du, so this idea of independence, um, which others would criticize as being, you know, the source of the problem. Um, John Hayan always thought that this was sort of the way out of the problem. So in this early um, 1894 essay called Ming Du, um, understanding independence or understanding. Um, yeah, understanding independence. Uh, there's the 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 ambiguity of this term is one of the things that's at stake. Um, he sort of explains how independence is key to actually any sort of social co cohesion. Um, so he, the essay opens by saying that if you meet a dancing youth, um, so uh, someone who's not very high up on the social ladder, and if you say to him your skills are common, he'll reach for his sword in anger. If you then say to the person, your skills are outstanding, you stand alone in the world, he will smile and chuckle. But then you say, when handling affairs of the world, you are incapable of joining with men, you act alone, he will reach for his sword in anger again. So he recognizes that there is this, um, even colloquial, co colloquially, there's this tension with the idea of, um, of being independent and being alone, that people want to stand out from the crowd, but they also want to be a part of a group and so you know it's both positive to stand out but negative to stand out depending on the context and John Hayen is trying to run with this. So he so he um, says uh, he basically makes three statements and this is these are the statements that get him into um, a lot of trouble according to Qin Hui um, because Qin Hui thinks that these three statements are typical of the um, Chinese political view and also the problems for all of the institutional rot of the 20th century. Um, but obviously John Tayen doesn't think this. Um, John Tayen says, those who are greatly independent will necessarily join up and those who do not join up are not independent. So that's sort of interesting. If, you, if you're actually joining up with people then you are um, in fact independent. Um, those who are greatly independent will necessarily join up. Groups are necessarily composed of the independent and then finally, and this is the thing that um, gets him into trouble in John in Qin Hui's eyes, is that small joining is a thief of great joining. Great independence is the mother of great um, joining. So, so the idea that there are between the um, great individ, independent individual, the da du, and the great um, 
joining together, Dachun, which later will become the state or the nationality, um, that all these smaller petty um, groupings are um, corrosive of that greater joining. And so, so it's this, um, so if you want to have a unified state, then you have to have this sort of great um, independence um, of all individuals and that all these intermediary smaller groups have to be sort of um, suppressed. So, so this is an early, um, this is sort of John Hayne's early writings in this, and this is um, the sort of Qin Hui in his book that was, came out in 2015 and that was quickly banned in China, um, um, develops this, but it's, he also develops it in much earlier essays that are easily available. But um, Qin's basic argument, which is repeatedly um, returning to John Tayen's, is that John Tayen um, was symptomatic. So I'm going to number three first. John Tayen was symptomatic of the continuing influence of this idea of a big community um, that, 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 and it's this emphasis on the big community that's actually holding back the um, intellectual progress that was being made by late Qing reformers. So the late Qing reformers were actually um, right in their criticism of the Qin state and that that criticism was lost um, by the, certainly by the May 4th movement um, when the criticism that was rightly directed at the state turned to being directed at these small intermediary groups, including families. Um, and so the, the critique of the imperial state never actually gained um, traction. Um, and this was, in Qin's view, a sort of missed opportunity in the late Qin. So, so Qin Hui and John Tian actually, their characterization of what um, the problem is or what the nature of the Chinese polity is, is identical, but they draw exactly opposite conclusions. Um, so, so Qin Hui is for a constitutional republic, John Tian is um, adamantly, at least after his imprisonment in the early 20th century, is adamantly opposed to a constitutional republic. Qin Hui is pro-feudal pro and anti-centralization. John Tian is anti-feudal and pro-centralization. Um, Qin Hui thinks that ch radical Chinese equality is the problem. John Tian thinks it's the solution to all of China's problems. Qin Hui thinks that Chinese distrust is the problem. And John Tian thinks that giant Chinese distrust of everyone is the solution. Uh, so they're basically batting around the, um, they're working in the framework that was set up by Dong Chao, which is what is the exact relationship between um, er aristocracy, Guizhu, and um, people's rights. So Dong Chao famously says that um, the West had, the, had an aristocracy, which then became the source for an opposition to the state that preserved people's rights, whereas the lack of Chinese aristocracy um, was the reason why China um, doesn't have people's rights. Brandon, um, sorry, yeah. two more yes. minutes. Okay. Um, so let me skip ahead. So John, John Tayen, um, he sort of leans into this um, and he says that, um, that it's, it's suspicion and equality that are the are the keys to why China will avoid the pitfalls of Western parliamentary, what he thinks is Western parliamentary oligarchy and aristocracy. And this is where he turns to um, Nietzsche. And he emphasizes Nietzsche because he sees in the Chinese um, suspicion of others and their radical independence, sort of um, Renaissance, Italian Renaissance sort of spirit. Um, and he finds this specifically in, um, I'll move past this, um, more quickly, he finds this specifically in the um, in in central China in the areas around the Yangtze River, and he has this wildly interesting passage where he says that um, the the more clearly one knows people, the more difficult it is to secure a community, which he's going to say is a good thing. If we look at the condition of Chinese people today, they have no other strength except their knowledge of others. Zhiren such that if a powerful man would appear, he would find it easy to join with those beyond the Northern passes in Mongolia or amongst the overseas Chinese in the Southern seas, because these people are shallow in their understanding and do not know the quickly changing circumstances of interpersonal exchange. 
from north of the Elbe River to the Great Wall and south of Wuling to the Mount to Mount Ya, it's a bit harder to make people congeal. On the banks of the Yangtze River, people are clever and suspicious, peering into one another's breasts so that even if a European noble found himself suddenly born into their midst, there'd be no way to bring them together because everything would fall apart the moment they sized him up. So he thinks that it's precisely this notion of suspicion that has to be um, made universal. And that's the way in which the, which, um, the Chinese state is going to be able to continue the legacy of equality um, that was started in the Qin, um, that, um, but also support um, a new idea of a, 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 a large state that is governed by rules that um, sort of, um, that, that it's, that's the idea of, this idea of rules and laws um, that will actually um, be able to complete what the Qin had started by um, creating a space in which um, this sort of, at least a, 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 a space set aside from sort of radical um, individualism of these people um, who are suspicious and that they can all agree on laws and that they, um, but nevertheless, there'll be this space outside of the laws where their um, creative um, selves are still able to flourish. Um, so, he, so, so he draws this, um, he uses this idea of Chinese individualism and selfishness as a way to reconstruct the possibility of a field and the possibility of institutions, um, even though the premises um, are, are frequently used in certainly modern institutional historiography as the reason why we should escape from that way of thinking about institutions because it implies that there's nothing real about institutions, that there are no, um, that there can be no um, possibility of groups or institutions because those things are illusory and the only thing that um, is real is individual um, suspicion. Um, and so it's, I think the, and sort of to wrap this up quickly, I'll, I'll say that this is John Tayan's thinking on um, the legacy of the Qin and the legacy of centralization um, is an interesting way of thinking about um, how these, um, how the, how our assumptions about human nature or the nature of um, cultural processes um, relate to institutional history. Um, thanks. Thank you very much, Trenton. And we can have uh, Xiao Yong's comment. And I already encourage people who uh, want to ask questions to uh, start raising their hands so we can start with a discussion after the response. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so, you know, I, I just want to start by saying that there was a lot of great stuff in um, Trenton Wilson's paper that uh, did not come out in the presentation. So, you know, I absolutely enjoyed reading this. Um, you know, I, I love the way it began with the wedge, which is, was also the beginning of the presentation because it resonates so much with my own conversations with Chinese students at Denison, right? You know, some of them, you know, clearly espouse a kind of conservative elitism that, uh, you know, basically dismisses ordinary Chinese people as not having the ability to practice active democratic citizenship responsibly. So ordinary Chinese people are supposedly too ignorant, too irrational, too gullible to be trusted with freedom of speech and the right to vote. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's really interesting, but, you know, unlike the literati of imperial times, uh, you know, it seems to me these students lack both the moral idealism and the courage to criticize a ruler. So they don't desire freedom of speech even for themselves, let alone for, um, ordinary folks. Um, but, uh, let, let me move on to, uh, Zhang Taiyan, right? So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dalton Wilson's fascinating analysis of Zhang Taiyan's ideas about individualism and equality, right? Um, uh, has really enriched my understanding of Zhang's political thought, right? Uh, so I, I recently read Peter Zero's book, After Empire, The Conceptual Transformation of Chinese State um, for a class on Chinese political culture that I'm teaching at Denison, or that I taught last semester, actually, at Denison. Uh, so Peter Zero's book was published 10 years ago. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna quote a passage of it because I think it, it's kind of relevant to understanding Zhang Taiyan's skepticism uh, or distrust toward um, constitutional Republican government. 
right? So Zero writes, uh, you know, and here I quote, insofar as Zhang thought well of democracy, it was as a form of egalitarianism. But Zhang sharply expressed his skepticism towards Republican institutions. He derided the very notion of representation and was more attracted to something like Rousseau's general will. He attacked parliaments on the grounds that elections would merely confirm the present day corruption of local power holders. Furthermore, for any kind of democracy to work, property had to be equalized. Socialism was thus a necessary condition for the kind of democracy that Zhang could support. Zhang seems to have regarded socialist egalitarianism and state ownership of resources and industry as the sole guarantee that uh, democratic institutions would not increase the gaps between rich and poor, rulers and ruled. Uh, and you know, I, I'll jump on to a little later on in the, in the same uh, part of the book. Uh, constitutionalism, Zhang distrusted, right? He distrusted, distrusted constitutionalism, both because it seemed a way to maintain the Manchu sovereignty over China. So, you know, constitutional monarchy, monarchy in this case. And because Republican institutions were a means by which vested private interests entrenched themselves. So constitutionalism was a little more than a disguise for feudalism, Feng Jian. But, uh, you know, to Zhang Taiyan's mind, it, from his reading of history, China had abandoned the Feng Jian system 2000 years earlier. So why would we want to go back to that? So under these circumstances, constitution, constitutionalism would simply augment the powers already held by local power holders, especially without top-down measures to ensure that property was held equally. So here I end uh, the quote and move on to my own remarks. Um, so, you know, based on that and based on, uh, uh, you know, uh, Trenton's paper, uh, it was thus a kind of populist, socialist egalitarianism that drove Zhang's rejection of representative government and constitutional liberal de democracy, right? In that sense, you could say that he presaged the Chinese Communist Party, but he also had a much stronger orientation towards uh, individualism, elitism, which, you know, is kind of ironic given that he also is egalitarian in some ways, right? But elitism uh, and freedom of, of expression. So, you know, Zhang Taiyan's ideal Chinese state, it seems to me, is one in which the minority of non-conformists, revolutionaries, and free thinkers, right? Those you know, intellectual superman, if you want to use a Nietzschean uh, uh, phrase, just like Zhang Taiyan himself uh, used in the quote that Trenton showed us, right? Those intellectual superman with a sense of great independence, Da Du, can come together to form great communities, Da Xun, without having to bow to the tyranny of the mediocre, unintellectual majority, right? So this is essentially a somewhat elitist formula for a vibrant civil society where intellectuals' right to independent thinking was protected by law. Kind of like the kind of uh, place that Qin Hui would like to live in, actually, right? Um, but Zhang Taiyan envisions an independent judiciary, an independent education sector. The schools are not going to be state run. And citizens with the right to criticize the law, right, with impunity and to live as recluses without paying any taxes to the state, right? Um, and these are certainly not the ideas of an apologist for aut autocracy, right? Which Qin Hui, I think, might accuse them of being. But I, I agree with Trenton that actually is not being fair to Zhang Taiyan. Um, although, you know, it is true that Zhang Taiyan, when rejecting the idea of a constitution, clearly failed to think through the institutional checks that would be needed to prevent a strong centralized socialist state like the one that he hoped for from simply changing the law to suppress the freedom of expression that he valued so much. Mm. Now, um, I'm going to say one more thing, and then, uh, you know, we, we definitely um, should let Trenton give his um, uh, response and then move on to Q&A. Um, but what, what I find hard to understand, you know, even after reading Clinton's paper is that, you know, John Taiyan assumed that parliamentary democracy would be a return to this kind of decentralized aristocratic feudalism, rather than, you know, as we, you know, I think Western liberals tend to assume a vehicle for bourgeois, and even, you know, I think even Marxists and communists think that way, rather than a vehicle for bourgeois capitalist interests, right? The communists would argue that parliamentary democracy was basically, you know, a, a vehicle for the bourgeois, the bourgeoisie, right, the, the, and, and the capitalists to dominate the state, right? Whereas Zhang Taiyan seems to think that parliamentary democracy would be basically a return to some kind of aristocracy, some kind of feudal uh, situation. Now, he, he, you know, it seems to me, or he seems to me to have feared a, revision, a reversion from the unified empire, right, that had mastered from the Qian to the Qing, to a, a fragmented world of warring states. Right, so basically, if we go from uh, what we currently have to a constitutional democracy, we're basically going to be reverting from the unified empire um, to 
a kind of warring states feudalism. Um, and you know, I, I would say that you know the warlord period of nineteen twenties probably made his fear seem prescient. Right? He wrote this before uh, the warlords, but uh, you know, he probably kind of felt like saying, "I told you so." You know, in the nineteen twenties, um, uh, when China seemed did, did seem very um, you know warring states like. But you know, Xin Hui, Xin Hui, uh, in his assessment of uh, Zhang Taiyan um, and his you know own liberalism, clearly thinks differently. Uh, Xin Hui sees this, the Xin unification as a tragic triumph of autocratic statism over what he believes to have been the original independent and critical spirit of Confucianism. Mm. So I wonder if this reflects a major difference between Chinese modernizers of the early 20th century, uh, among whom I guess we can include Zhang Taiyan, and the Chinese liberals of today in that the modernizers of the early 20th century saw Confucianism as the villain in China's failure to achieve modernity. Whereas the liberals, the Chinese liberals of today, like Qin Hui, tend to see the legacy of legalism as the true villain behind China's failure to achieve democracy, right? albeit a legalism that has long been hidden behind a Confucian facade. Right? But it's not Confucianism that is the culprit, uh, so to speak, but it's really the legalism hiding behind um, this facade of Confucianism. So yeah, I, I will end here, and uh, you know, I, I would love to hear more from Trenton from the audience. Um, yeah, I mean, for this, for the sake of time, I don't want to say too much more because I think that um, Shaolin has has said it all. <laughs> um, I mean, in the sense that that I mean, that is the I mean, that is very much, especially the last comment you made. That is very much the the situation in which um, Xin Hui. Or that's the way that Qinghui wishes to position himself is that, you know, that there was this. I mean, he says that uh, I mean, his I, his uh, heroes are, according to him, the fan fa zhi ru, so the 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 ru of the late Qing who were opposed to the fa, um, so the scholars who were opposed to the state and to legalism, and especially those scholars. I mean, he one of the one of the fascinating things about reading his writings is that he uses a lot of, of um, sort of incidental diary writings, you know, people who had traveled abroad as emissaries for the Qing who are, you know, discovering in, in England and in Paris and in other places in the US, the, um, you know, they were writing things like, you know, we, 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 we arrived here in Paris and we discovered that they're living like the three dynasties, <laughs> you know, they're living like the Sun Dai. And so, you know, for for Qin Hui, he thinks that this is a real missed opportunity because um, you know there was this moment where there wasn't an opposition between Western and Chinese culture. That there was this sort of possibility. I mean, for him, a missed opportunity where um, where there was a fusion of ideals. It was as if these people recognized finally that um, you know we were all aimed at the same thing, and that he sees the May Fourth Movement as a betrayal of that possibility because by turning inwards against the um, Chinese family and these other sort of what he thinks are robust Chinese institutions, um, even though John Tian would disagree with that assessment, um, he, um, he sees the, the route to the present. Um, and so I don't think that, I don't wanna cast him as a naive reader of John Tian because I think that he's not. I think that he just sees in John Tian a symptom of the Chinese tradition um, that can't escape from this, um, this, you know, this legacy of the Qin, and that can't even look seriously at the ideals of Confucius, <laughs> because, because the uh, the the Qin ideal is too powerful. Um, and this is, I mean, this is very interesting, especially in, um, I think, in light of. Um, discussion yesterday about the legacy of legalism in Chinese tradition as well. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. And I see two questions. And before I pass the word to Richard, I would like everyone, especially our speakers uh, and keynotes to stick with us for the final comments where we will talk about the publication since one of the potential editors is among us, you might want to stick with us a little bit longer. So first we're gonna finish the discussion and then I promise we're gonna be efficient and then we will let you go and won't uh, linger on too, for too long. Uh, Richard first and then Michael. Um, so thank you very much. I, I have a remark and a question uh, for Michael. Um, 
it's a great pity that Carlo Natali has left us because it would be very interesting to hear what he had to say about, um, uh, uh, particularly about your paper. I want, my remark is you didn't use the word uh, individual, which is mm. very good uh, because individual is not part of the political or indeed the ethical vocabulary of Aristotle um, as indeed, um, nor, as, nor is, is the term people, the people plays no role at all. So, well, that's a slight exaggeration. But so the really interesting thing is, is what you mean by self-rule. Ah. Um, and um, Aristotle, as I'm sure you know, says that um, um, humans uh, alone are not autark and they require um, a certain um, biotope surroundings in order to live. And, uh, and especially to live well, but go on. And to live well, they require a polis. Mm -hmm. um, which, um, and so the question is what, um, what you are thinking of in terms of self-rule when you say that the Junzi in um, Sunzi is, uh, is some kind of self-ruler. Um, and what, what that means. I mean, does he have uh, a household, an estate? Mm -hmm. um, uh, where is he? Um, is he sitting in a back lane in a straw hut eating rotten rice? Mm -hmm. um, what, what kind of self-rule are you thinking of? And what, under those circumstances, does, does a good life mean? Sorry, that was a bunch of questions. Yes, it was. Um, I'll try to do the best. I think, and I was thinking about this in relation to Trenton's paper as well. Um, it seems to me that the fundamental political problem is always between Du and Chun. Mm. Chun is a central part of what Schwinza is talking about. And though, of course, Chun doesn't exist as a term for Aristotle, that is what he's trying to get at. What is this relation um, between the household um, and the polis? Um, that is the central issue, okay? So how do you get from one to the other? Because both in both accounts of um, a person who is by turns ruled and self-ruled, um, a ruler and rule, um, ruled. Um, and that's Aristotle's description of the citizen. That would work very well in Schwinza. There are constraints on you. You are ruled by things. Um, but rational deliberation will allow you um, to the degree that it's humanly possible. And, that's one reason I like both Aristotle and Schwinza. They always add these qualifications to the degree it's politically possible, um, humanly possible. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, they are trying to imagine what it would take to have a flourishing uh, person and also a flourishing society simultaneously because you can't have one without the other. Um, they are codependent, as it were, okay? So one of the things I think that's so interesting about Schwinza um, is that um, he is, as it were, um, allowing for the possibility um, that every single person, Ren, and he says this, from the ruler on down has certain capacities, okay? Now he realizes by force of circumstance that the farmer in the field may not have time to exercise those capacities. Um, he's by no means unpragmatic, um, but he believes that that person, if liable to proper societal training, can himself um, um, not only exercise rational deliberation, um, but be engaged in some measure of mobility, okay? 
Um, so I think that is very important, that that's part of his picture, this up and down picture. And I want to pull in, I was teaching all day yesterday from dawn to dusk, so I wasn't here yesterday. But I wanted to pull in an idea. I've really been thinking hard about Sarah Allen's um, book, Buried Ideas and the Notions of Abdication. And I've said this to Sarah, so I think I can say it to all. Um, Sarah ends her book by saying, of course, these ideas couldn't continue into the empire because they would be politically dangerous. And I said, oh no, <laughs> they are right on the table always. And why are they right on the table always? Partly because of Shunza, partly because of ideas ascribed to Confucius when writing the Gongyang, that he has become a shadow king. So one of our problems when we're talking about comparative political philosophy is people always have in mind these isms. Um, I was reading George Orwell yesterday with my students, um, Politics and the English Language. And what he says is these isms, we don't know what they mean, we fling them around. So people who fling Confucianism or legalism around, damn it, I wanna say, well, whom are you, who, whom are you discussing? So I know you're not doing that, but I think that there's a reason why abdication, Shunza says, um, uh, yield to the worthy. He adopts the Moa slogan that the only people who should ever be in power are the people of worth. And that's why I bring it up, um, Sarah Allen's excellent book from which I learned so much. Um, because it's a reinforcement, actually, of where these ideas come from. Um, and we see that from excavated and unprovenance manuscripts. So um, I think we have really underplayed um, this notion and a powerful notion in Han Dynasty. Um, um, and Han Dynasty is a above all the realm of Shunza, Mencius is hardly on the radar screen, except for Yanshong and a very small group of people. Um, so um, it's Shunza and Shunza, it's all about employ the worthy, testing. Um, Michael Lowy just wrote a book on advisors and consultants. It's all about bringing people from the outside and then testing their capacities. That's the whole institutional set, a system of checks and balances in the Han period, in theory, okay? Um, and in practice in many ways, because institutions were set up to do this, okay? Um, whereas I think if we look to the case of Aristotle, we have to say um, that Aristotle is terrified that any political system, no matter how ideal in the beginning, uh, falls apart because of self-interest groups. In fact, he sounds like Ho Shu Dong. He sounds like John. He sounds like conversations going on in modern China, I think. Um, and, and he spends a long time talking about how each um, uh, kind of constitution will devolve immediately if factions are um, um, of self-interest um, gain the upper hand. Um, so we see both societies trying to put in institutions uh, that will provide checks and balances. Um, but I think in the end, I stand by my gut feeling and I need to be critiqued by precisely people like you. Um, um, Shunza has a more capacious vision of what is the human potential. Okay. Because uh, we may be born ugly and anybody who's brought up two-year-olds knows, um, yes, there's a lot of ugliness um, in small children. Um, but in theory for him, we can all be brought to rational deliberation, which is aesthetically satisfying not only for the person, but for those who see the person. 
I wish I could say I'm aesthetically satisfying for my students, but anyway, there we are. <laughs> Thank so, you so much. Long answer, long answer, sorry. <laughs> Michael, your, your question, please. <laughs> Oh, my question, in a way, I folded it into that because um, I think that when we're talking about small groups, um, I think you, Trenton, used the word that they're illusory. Um, I don't think they're illusory. I think they're, they're, we're getting here the, the, the very clear language um, inherited, I would say, from Shunza as to what is a small-minded group, what is a petty group, grouping, um, versus, um, and Bangu talks about all this time, what is someone who has a sense of the realm and what the realm needs. Just my gut feeling that this is the language that's being invoked. You know Zhang Taiyan and uh, Qin Hui much better than I do. Um, so I, I'm just wondering whether this is language that comes to them naturally because this is actually um, Shunza and Han dynasty all the way down. Um, uh, through this. And I guess the other comment was to show you and um, very briefly, I don't think anyone writes except for an occasion. Um, David McMullen has made the point that every single essay by Han Yu was occasional, um, meaning it was about the politics of the time, which didn't mean he didn't want it to participate in larger conversations. Um, so we write for the world we inherit. Um, and I thought your comments about the 20s versus the 80s was right on um, because uh, Qin Hui is writing for the world he knows and Zhang Taiyan for the world he knows. Um, but then do we say, well, we need to dismiss them um, because they're occasional pieces. No, everything we write is occasional. Um, and um, I think, yeah, um, we're more and more aware of that um, every day. <laughs> Sadly, because of American bad politics, we're more and more aware of that every day. Now I shut up. <laughs> but in Thank you, Michael. And we have one last time for one last question before we wrap up with Xiao Ji Yan. Yes. Um, so we are running out of, time, out of time. So very briefly, uh, my question is uh, addressed to Professor Michael Leinen. Mm -hmm. Hi, Michael. So um, I, um, I have a more general question about uh, it. Uh, I couldn't help but uh, sensing there were two drives simultaneously going on in your work, uh, mm -hmm. both at this presentation and past several talks, including the one uh, most obviously at Oxford recently. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. On the one hand, you are a dedicated historian uh, and you always remind us how important it is to be uh, true to the past and uh, basically reconstruct what uh, was going on in um, the Han Dynasty, for instance. Um, on the other hand, uh, I also noticed that uh, you uh, just, as you just mentioned, um, perhaps because of the um, current situation in American politics or um, uh, something uh, uh, um, more than that, um, that you wanted to work out uh, uh, from the Chinese tradition a better alternative than the ones uh, that currently uh, you use uh, from the Western tradition. Uh, in this case, Aristotle um, shows as a better um, alternative than Aristotle. Uh, well, on the other hand, so uh, you also criticize those uh, so self-identified uh, Confucian political theorists who uh, claim their um, approach to be philosophical. So mm -hmm. uh, my question is, how do you see the two drives in your work, if my uh, sense True. is right? Um, I think you've somewhat misidentified uh, one of the drives, uh, but I have left you liable to misidentifying it. It's not just America that's in a parlous state. 
How about England? How about I could go down the list, okay? Um, I think um, what I'm looking for is are there more interesting conversations going on in other times and places? And uh, what most of my best friends are philosophers, okay? Um, so it's not I'm criticizing philosophers, I'm doing a specific thing. I'm saying, don't read um, the philosophers as if they're not in conversation with people in their own time. Don't take a stray line and blow it up. Um, try and understand the conversation to which they are responding. Um, and so that's not a critique of philosophers. I think the best philosophers all do that. What is of a critique of is people who say they know what the ism is and they never do any investigation to see what are people of the time talking about. So they'll talk about legalism, for example, without looking at um, anything produced in the period on law, or they'll talk about ritualism, um, all Jewy Galitza. Many, many people assume from time immemorial that filial piety was absolutely the be all and end all of Confucianism. Well, it wasn't. It's barely on the radar screen, except when it comes to burial matters, um, because there's so many other values that are on the radar screen um, uh, for the people of the time. So um, I realize that by Ming times, uh, filial piety is not only on the radar screen, but has become almost a pathological, um, in the words of a dear friend of mine, Mara Epstein, who writes on this, obsession um, as the be all and end all virtue. But what I'm arguing instead is that in people of the late warring states through let's say 316, which is when I fall off the screen, um, um, uh, filial piety is a virtue, but it is certainly um, has, it's one of many that needs to be thought about when people are deciding what to do. Um, if you pay attention to the Xiaojing, for example, enormously important in the Qin and Han periods, um, what is filial piety? It's serving the state so you can feed your parents. Not what we think of as obedience, or even if you go to the Lunyu. Um, we know the famous line in the Lunyu, you're not obedient to your parents, you're obedient to the ritual. Um, these conversations are live in the period I'm talking about, and they aren't live later on. So like every other person I know who is fully engaged in the world, I have on my mind, we're living in a terrible time. Um, how could that not be on our mind? But uh, what I'm really trying to do is find conversations um, in the time period and not import ideas to the degree that that's possible. It's never perfectly possible, not import ideas into my readings of the sources. And one way not to do that is to read broadly across sources of different types. So I'm as interested philosophically in an edict and a memorial as I am in Shunza. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And Yumi has a question, but she says she can write to you. And so I think we need to wrap up now. First of all, I would like to thank uh, all our last panel for a very wonderful uh, high note on which we can conclude the scientific part of the workshop. Thanks everyone for participating. And